Okay, I think I'm turned on and it's great to be with you. Uh, Wesley Key called me. Oh, it's been months ago. He was uh, quite early on the schedule. Wondered if I would uh, be available to speak at the summer series. And uh, the Grant Church would give me three Wednesdays to speak in summer series. And they were always gracious to expand that. Give me another uh, one or two more. And so I actually have four this year. And it's a great pleasure to be here with Farley. And whenever uh, you have an opportunity to speak, us preachers, we look forward to any occasion uh, to share the Word of God. So I'm grateful to you and a lot of men you could have invited, and I'm thankful that uh, you've invited me to come your way. Uh, when I came in tonight, my wife was with me, my daughter Ashley, and when I came in, Josh met me at the door and introduced himself and his wife Lakin. Haven't met her yet, but I wish them the very best. It's been uh, 40 years uh, since I finished school and started my first work preaching. Uh, in Otisville, Michigan, and I've had an interesting journey and a lot of good, good things uh, in my life from preaching. So I, I think if I was an elder of the church looking for a preacher, uh, I'd go after a Freed Hardeman graduate. And I go to Freed about every year, and I appreciate uh, their emphasis upon the Bible. I appreciate the four-year undergraduate uh, uh, work that they do there, and I, you have a good one. Don't know him yet. But I'm sure you have a, a preacher well-trained and ready for his task here. Uh, tonight we're looking at Samuel. And when Wesley called, and uh, he told me the theme is we're looking at uh, leaving a legacy. And then we're looking at a character of the Bible. He said, well, what character would you like? And I immediately said, well, I'll take Samuel. And there's some reasoning for this. And uh, the folks here on this row uh, from Grant... Uh, understand we had a Thursday class every Thursday and this is part of the Thursday class and we were studying the book of first Samuel and I was involved in studying that when Wesley called and I thought well I'll just go with Samuel and so we appreciate this group from Grant uh, dear Christian friends and uh, Wesley's mother Peggy you know her she's been here before I'm sure many times as Aunt Lucretia and then uh, Jean Brewer and Gail Tuggle, uh, wonderful people. I know it would be a joy in your life to get to know them a little better. I see a monitor on the back here, uh, not turned on. Do I need to do something to turn it on? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, there it is, all right. So... We're good. I appreciate that big monitor. Sometimes I'll call and say to a church, do you have a, a PowerPoint? And do you have a monitor? Oh, yeah, we got a monitor. Uh, yeah. And I'll get up to preach and be a little old TV back monitor down back there. And I forgot my binoculars, you know, to see it. So, but that's very nice. And so uh, we will look a little bit at this PowerPoint uh, tonight. When we think about uh, Samuel, I think about his mother, and recently we celebrated, well, last Sunday, Father's Day, and I admit, I, I was out of town, so I didn't have my Father's Day lesson. But before this, I had a Mother's Day, and I really emphasize, I didn't say anything about fathers. I have a weekly radio program on Sunday morning and didn't mention a thing about fathers. Uh, but when it was Mother's Day, they were on the radio. I talked about mothers in the Bible class, morning worship, evening worship, and we really appreciate uh, those of you Christian mothers uh, who are here tonight. And I saw this ad, and it was uh, to elevate womanhood, and I think you will enjoy it if I can see it. Here's an advertisement for a job for a mother, and I can't, so I'm going to read it here. Uh, there is an opening for a long-term position. Uh, though the job is challenging, once you accept the job, there's absolutely no quitting. The work environment is often chaotic. The skills needed involves the ability to handle multiple tasks simultaneously. Uh, exceptional organizational skills is a must. Uh, you must be willing to work around the clock 
which will often require sleepless nights. If you're enjoying a few moments to enjoy personal care or interest, you must be ready when duty calls to be back at work within a minute or less. Uh, taking evenings and weekends away from this job will not be a possibility. And so that's the idea of being a mother. And uh, it's, it's true, really, isn't it? Uh, when it's humorous, it's also true. And uh, we appreciate mothers. Uh, the demands of the job. You must be willing to be disliked, uh, even hated, at least temporarily, by one who you're working for. However, this will soon end when they urgently need something. <laughs> Uh, you must possess the physical stamina of a pack mule and be able to go from zero to 60 miles per hour in three seconds flat. And so we're elevating women tonight as we think about uh, Samuel and his work. We think a little bit about, uh, you know, the wages for the compensation. Uh, get this, you pay them, offering frequent raises and bonuses. Uh, a balloon payment is due when they turn 18 because of the assumption that college will help them become financially independent. When you die, you give them whatever is left. So that's the payment for the job. And a little bit more of uh, some of the additional job requirements. Uh, you're going to be nurse and also a teacher, cook, shopper, cleaner, maid, counselor, negotiator, and referee, and driver, and hairdresser, and event coordinator. And so this brings us to the idea of Hannah. You know, Hannah wanted to be a mother. And she was living during a day when she was in a great predicament because of polygamy. And we understand that her husband, Elkanah, uh, he had two wives. Hannah was a wife, and... Panina was another wife. Panina had children. And in these days, you know, to be barren was almost a disgrace. And here you have this friction going on between Hannah and Panina. And Panina had all these children. Hannah had none. And she was grieved by it. Well, every year, Archaea would go to the temple in Shiloh. The tabernacle was in Shiloh at this time. And they would go to Shiloh to offer their sacrifice to worship God. And what they would do, you know, they would offer the sacrifice and there'd be three portions. The fat belonged to God. And then, of course, the priest got his portion, a shoulder and a uh, breast. And then also a portion went to the family. And they would take it home and have a meal in conjunction of honor to God. And um, what uh, Elkiah would do, he would give Hannah a double portion because he really loved Hannah. But yet, Penelope uh, had all these children, but yet he gave Hannah a double portion. And this was kind of a trigger. Uh, Penelope was jealous of Hannah. And when Hannah would be given this double portion every year when they went to shallow, she would taunt Hannah. Kind of like this, I have children and you don't. I gave Elkiah all these children. You haven't given me many children. And it really grieved Hannah because of this. And she wept. And as they were enjoying this uh, festivity, uh, she would not eat. She was in a depressive mood, if you will. And so she goes to the tabernacle. And outside the entry to the tabernacle, uh, she goes to God in prayer. And as she's praying, of course, she's praying for a male child. And Eli, who's the priest at that time, and also he was a prophet of Israel, Eli was sitting there at the door of the tabernacle. He saw uh, Hannah, and he saw her lips moving, but nothing coming from her mouth. And he presumed she was drunk. And he rebuked Hannah for her drunkenness. And so we begin to read in our text again, and I'm sorry I can't see that. Would I be better up here? Is there a monitor here? Huh? Okay, okay. How long will you be drunk? Eli says. Put your wine away from you. 
Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink. But then she says, But you have poured out my soul uh, before the Lord. And so she said, I'm not drunk, you know, I'm distraught. And we see here, so Eli says, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And so, I don't even know if Eli knew what she had prayed for at this point. Uh, when you read the text, you know, nothing indicates, you know, she's praying and she's distraught. He says, May God grant your request. I don't know if he knew uh, that, he, that she had prayed for a male child. But he says, in essence, that God's going to grant uh, that request of yours. So Hannah, we see that as she was praying before this uh, talk she had with Eli, we see here's the vow she made to God. If you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. So her idea is you give me a child, I'll give him back to the Lord all the days of his life. Rhonda and I, my wife, we go to the Freed Harlem in lectureship every single year. And one year, you know, they were honoring this J.A. Thornton. Every year at the lectureship they honor a preacher. They have a meal, uh, they honor him. They have speakers to come. And so uh, it's a great occasion. I have been to these. Uh, J.A. Thornton reminds me a little bit about Samuel. Because we see J.A. Thornton, he was born on a hot August day and said he weighed two and a half pounds, pillow and all. And the doctor assumed he would die and he kind of hands over the pillow and the baby uh, to a nurse and he goes on taking, to the, t uh, taking care of the needs uh, of the mother. Uh, Virgie Thornton, his mother, vowed, I will give him back to God. In her desperation, she prayed like Hannah this prayer, hey, if my son will live, I'll give him back to God. And at the 1994 Freed Lectureship, they honored uh, Brother Thornton for his 53 years of preaching uh, the gospel. And so we think about Hannah and her prayer. And she prayed for her son. And she prayed, if you give to me, I'll give him back to you all the days of your life. Uh, Rhonda and I, before our children were born, we prayed. My daughter's here. We prayed for her and prayed for my son before they were born. Our pray went, prayer went like this, that they'll become Christians, that they'll uh, marry a Christian, and that their family will be an asset of whatever congregation they belong to. Uh, Rhonda went to Tuscaloosa and met Ashley's boyfriend, and Rhonda came home and said, hey, he's the one, <laughs> Gerald. Wish Gerald could be here tonight. And later, as they grew closer, we met in Birmingham, went to the Galleria Mall, ate at Olive Garden, then we went and spent some time at the mall sitting around talking, and I guess I was a little bit, you know, self-righteous maybe, and I said, hey, we've been praying for this. Before Ashley was born, we'd been praying that she'd met, meet a good Christian man. And I was kind of set back when they said, well, you know, we've been praying that too. <laughs> and, well, I tell you, God answers prayer. And if you have children, be praying uh, that prayer uh, for them. So we think about the idea of, uh, of Samuel and when Samuel was weaned, this doesn't mean he was a baby. Uh, weaned men a little more. I don't know how old he would have been, but old enough to take care of himself to a degree. And so it came time when Elkiah went to the tabernacle that uh, Hannah went. She took the boy and she gave him to Eli and said, this is what I prayed for and God granted my request. And here I'm giving him to the Lord all the days of his life. But what we see here... And it might be my glasses, so it's not your fault. But uh, what we see here is the same house, but a different outcome. That Eli, he has sons. They were corrupt sons, Hophni and Phinehas. 
You know, their names are Egyptian names, and so why would he name them Egyptian names anyway instead of Hebrew names? But Hothna and Phineas, you know, they were priests who would serve at the tabernacle, and the people would bring in their sacrifice for God, and uh, Hothna and Phineas would send a servant with a flesh hook, and they'd thrust it into the sacrifice, probably twist it and pull them a hunk of meat out, and they'd take it. And that was in violation to the law of the Lord. And the worshipers became very discouraged because of this. That they were just dishonoring God. And then women would come to the tabernacle and uh, they were committing adultery with the women that came to the tabernacle. And so God was very displeased with Hothna and Phineas. But yet also we see that, uh, we see that the confrontation that we see here that, that Eli, Eli, it's like a dad who says, Son, you will not do that. Son, you're embarrassing me. Instead of saying, give me the keys and you get in that house. And the Bible says that Eli, in 1 Samuel 3, 13, did not restrain his children. It's one thing to say to your boys, hey, man, you all not do that. Come on, you can do better than that. Or to put the foot down and say, give me your keys and get up in your room. And don't come out until you can behave. But they kept going to the tabernacle and dis being disobedient to Almighty God. And what happened? An unnamed prophet came along. And this unknown prophet prophesied to Eli of the demise that would come to his family because of these unruly sons. And how that the uh, priesthood would be taken from their family. We know from history later it was given to Zadok. And so this prophet came and prophesied of the doom that would come about. But what is so interesting here though is that there's Samuel. And Samuel's living in that same environment influenced by Hothni and Phinehas. But he did not go the direction of Hothni and Phinehas. So we see here, as we look at this outline of the chapter, we see that uh, God calls Samuel to be a prophet. Uh, Samuel was, he was a priest, he was also the last judge of Israel, but also he was a prophet of God. And here's this initiation, the word of God was not widespread in these days, there was not a lot of revelation. And so God calls Samuel, and Samuel is sleeping, and God says, Samuel, and Samuel jumps up and runs into Eli, and evidently they had quarters attached to the tabernacle, uh, probably a, a tent-like quarters in which they lived, and uh, Samuel goes into Eli, what do you want? I didn't call you, go back to bed. So a second time he hears the voice, Samuel, and he goes in, Eli, what, what do you want? You called me. No, I didn't call you, go lay down. A third time, Samuel, and Finally, when he went to Samuel the third time, Samuel said, that must be God. And next time God calls you, say, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. And so we see that God spoke to Samuel. Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. And God gave Samuel a revelation. He told Samuel of the demise that was going to come upon Eli's house, much like the unknown prophet had told Eli. How that his sons would not reach a, a, an old age. And because of Eli and the way he had mismanaged things and the way he allowed the temple and temple worship to be so abused that God was going to deal. And so uh, God is telling uh, Samuel this in a revelation. Now the next morning we see Samuel very courageous. He gets up early in the morning. It's kind of like, I'm going to get busy as I can because you, what if Eli comes to me and he wants to, what did the Lord say to you? Well, you know, well. So he's busy opening the doors of the tabernacle and Eli sends word to Samuel. Hey, what did the Lord want? What did the Lord say to you last night? And Samuel told him. Courageously he told him. Everything the Lord had communicated. He didn't soften it up. He didn't make it more palatable. He just told Eli exactly what the Lord... Matter of fact, we see that uh, Samuel, he says none of his words uh, fall to the ground. He told him exactly. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul in Acts 20, 27, that, you know, where, where he says that, you know... He, he, did, he preached the whole counsel of God. 
He said he did not shun to preach that whole counsel of God. And that's the way anyone who preaches need to preach the whole counsel of God. My dad used to say, David, it's not what these preachers are saying. They're not teaching error. It's just that there's some things they're not saying. There's some t things that they are avoiding saying. But Samuel, don't we appreciate his great courage that he had in speaking and would encourage Josh to, to preach the word. Paul said instant in season and out of season. And Marshall Keeble said that means whether they like it or not. <laughs> and if I find they don't like it, I'll preach on it more. Because I figure, hey, we need that. You know, this is a real problem. And if they're not getting it, you know, it's a whole counsel of God. We preach it, don't we? And I appreciate Samuel uh, in this regard. So we see here that Samuel now, he's rising up and he's becoming respected. And the people recognize him. He works in the tabernacle. His mother would make him a robe, and which he would work in the tabernacle. She'd bring him a new robe every year. And... Uh, people knew widespread that he had become a prophet of God in a day when there weren't many prophets. And uh, during this time, we see the Philistine. They were the number one enemy of Israel during this time. For 20 years, uh, they reap havoc upon Israel. And the Philistines attacked the area of Shiloh. And so they came in and they attacked Shiloh and they killed 4,000 Israelites. And uh, it, it was a massacre. Matter of fact, you can well read elsewhere how they came into Shiloh and, and the great disaster that the Philistines caused. And uh, 4,000 people died. And so the leaders of Israel, they thought, well, here's what we'll do. We'll go attack the Philistines and we'll take our good luck charm with us. We'll take along the Ark of the Covenant. They had no authority for that. You know, they didn't pray to God and they didn't ask God, you know, how should we handle this? And they probably remember from their forefathers, the Ark of the Covenant, how that there at Mount Sinai, all this furniture was made and the tabernacle set up. And they probably remembered how that Ark of the Covenant was with them throughout that wilderness journey. They probably remember hearing, you know, from history and being stories told down how that uh, when the priest stepped into the Jordan River, you know, the waters departed and uh, the priest stood holding the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the Jordan River uh, while a person from every tribe went and got a huge stone and carried it out. And on the west side, they built this monument. And they built the monument so that when a father's maybe walking along and his children sees this monument, they say, hey, Dad, what's all that about? And they could tell their children what God had done. How the Ark of the Covenant and the water, the water parted and they got these stones. And so they had heard all these stories about the Ark of the Covenant and how that when they took the great city of Jericho, two walls, one 12 foot, the other inner wall six foot, and how that they carried the Ark of the Covenant, the priest did, one time for six days around the city of Jericho. And they did this on the seventh day. These priests carried it around seven times, blew the trumpet, and the walls fell down flat. So they thought, we'll take the Ark of the Covenant with us as a good luck charm. And they went into battle, and guess what? Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, went because they, were, they worked in the temple. They were priests. They cared for the Ark of the Covenant. And they were killed. And the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. For seven months, the Ark of the Covenant was in the hands of the Philistine people. And what happened? A messenger ran back to Shiloh to tell the news. And Eli was setting out. He was waiting on word from battle. And they told him, the Ark of the Covenant has been captured and your boys, Hophni and Phinehas, have been killed. And remember, he, fell, he was a big man. He fell over backward, broke his neck, and died. Samuel had prophesied about some of this. 
The prophet also prophesied, the unknown prophet, to Eli about the demise that would come to his family because of their disobedience and their disrespect for godly things, for the tabernacle, for the worship. And he falls over and he dies. Interesting thing now about the Ark of the Covenant, doesn't really have anything to do with any points that I will make, but just very interesting. This would make a, a great... Hollywood movie, uh, be better than anything I've, uh, you know, you, you see on Hollywood. Be great. And so people like to hear narratives. I do. And I think you'll enjoy, enjoy this particular uh, part of the narrative. They took the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines did. They had five major principal cities in, in the Philistine territory, each ruled by a prince. So they had five major cities and five princes, one to rule each city. And so they took the Ark of the Covenant and they first took it to Ashdod, three miles from the Mediterranean Sea. And this was a major city. This is where they had the main highway from Egypt to Syria. But also that's where the god Dagon, that's where his temple was. Interesting. They take the Ark of the Covenant into the Temple of Dagon and they put the Ark there in front. Here's this image of Dagon, this, I guess, statue of Dagon, their God, and they set the Ark of the Covenant there. The next morning when they came into the tabernacle, probably the priest of Dagon, guess what? Dagon had fallen over, prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> And they're wondering, what's going on here? Is Israel's God represented by the Ark of the Covenant more powerful than our God? And so they set him back up on the pedestal. Next morning, the priest or the people walk back in, and there's Dagon's head and hands laying on the, laying on the pedestal. That is head and hands in a miraculous way. There they are laying on the pedestal. And history tells us that the Philistines, after this period of time, uh, I think the Septuagint indicates this, that when the people came into worship, they would leap over that pedestal <laughs> because of this experience. They would leap over it. Well, also, while the Ark of the Covenant was in Ashdod, the people began to break out with tumors. Some of them were dying, these gross tumors growing all over them, and also, the city became rat-infested. Rats everywhere. And so they thought, man, you know, could this be because of the Ark of the Covenant? Is this just a coincidence? Or, you know, is this Israel's God punishing us? We need to get rid of this thing. So the priests, they decide, or the princesses, they talk together. and They decide, well, let's take it to Gath. Now, these are areas where, you know, the giants had settled after the conquest, Goliath of Gath. And so they took it to Gath, and they thought, we'll take it to Gath. And what happened? The people of Gath broke out in tumors. And the city and the region around became rat infested. And they said, we've got to get rid of this thing. And so the princes got together, and they thought, what are we going to do with it? Well, let's take it to the barren area. That's Ekron. The, the word means barren. Let's take it to Ekron. So they take the Ark of the Covenant to Ekron. The people say, we don't want that thing here. Have you brought the Ark of God here to kill us? But anyway, they took the Ark of God there, and guess what? Those people developed tumors. <laughs> they were dying. And also there were rats just everywhere infesting the area. And so they thought, man, we, we need to take this thing back and we need to give it back, <laughs> give it back where it came from. You ever say that to anybody? I want you going back where you came from. Uh, they wanted the Ark of the Covenant. They wanted to send it back into Israelite territory. So here we see as we look at the next chapter, a very interesting event that we see this trouble here, these Everywhere the Ark of the Covenant went in Philistine territory, uh, these, you know, these tumors and rats. And so the idea that we need to get rid of it, but we just can't send it back. We have to send a trespass offering with it. 
And so the apprentices got together, and what should we send as a trespass with the Ark of the Covenant? They said, let's do this. Let's send five gold tumors and five gold rats. You know, wow, really? So they molded, you know, made those five tumors, and they made them a little place to settle them in, and, and then we see the transfer. They made a brand new cart. Now, don't misplace this. You know, with Uzzah who took the ark. Later when they came to get the ark, years later, we read about Uzzah. But they made them a brand new cart. And they got them two milk cows. And they put the ark of the covenant on the new cow, card. And they put these, uh, you know, they put this trespass offering off. And they had a test here. Is this coincidental or is this the work of God? Is God... Is the God of Israel more powerful than Dagon? So they said, hey, I here's what we'll do. We'll move the calves away from the milk cows and we will send them to Beth Shemesh. If the milk cows divert and do not go into Israel, then we'll know that all this was just a coincidence. But if those milk cows go straight into Israel territory, then we'll know that, that this was the work of God. <laughs> and all this turmoil. And so they turned these cows loose and off it went toward uh, Beth Shemesh and they sent a delegation to spy out those milk cows and guess what? It, they didn't turn to the right or to the left. <laughs> they made a beeline right into Israel. Indicated that yes, this disaster with these tumors and the rats, it was the work of God. And the people there at Beth Shemesh, when they saw the ark of God coming, there was a great thanksgiving. And they took the uh, wood from the, from the cart, the wagon, and they cut it up for an offering. And there was a huge rock there. And they killed those milk cows and they made an offering, a sacrifice to Almighty God. And it was a time of great rejoicing. But then the tragedy. They set that. There's a big rock there at Beth Shemesh. And they set that uh, Ark of the Covenant on the rock. And people were interested in it. And they came and they took the lid off of it. And they looked in. They looked in the Ark. And they were amazed by it. Made God angry. And in his wrath, God killed 50,070 of them. You know, we just do not mishandle the things of God. We don't treat God in a casual way. You ever see the way people dress when they come into worship? We're coming into worship, Almighty God. Have you ever seen the instructions of the Old Testament when it came time to, to worship God? And, you know, the way we dress ourselves and... I think we need to be, you know, maybe cautious when we come to worship God that, that I think it's important. I think we're communicating even with our dress. And, but they were so casual, took the lid off, and hey, look in here, and probably talking to their buddies about what was in the Ark of the Covenant made God angry. The wrath of God. 50,070 of them laid down dead. Well, we come to our last slide in the series, a few more in conclusion, but here we find this last uh, slide, Israel's repentance. You know, the fear of God, this brought fear to the people, and they repented. They came back to God. And isn't that the case that oftentimes when we get casual in our commitment to God, and we kind of have a wake-up call, and, hey, I need to get back to God. This way, living separate and apart from God, it just doesn't work good. And so they had this repentance, and we read about that. And then we read about this reassurance. Along came the Philistines near Mishpah, and they attacked the Israelites again. And God sent a thunderbolt uh, throughout the Philistines, just a loud thundering sound, and it so confused the Philistines and set fear in them that they turned the Israelites 
you know, they defeated the Philistines that day. Indication that a reinsurance now. They have repented for 20 years. The Philistines have, have inflicted harm upon the Israelites. And now they have repented and now God gives them this reassurance. Hey, I'm with you now. You've turned to me, now I'm going to turn and be your helper. And remember, uh, Samuel set up that stone, Ebenezer, that stone, which means, you know, uh, our help, our help. Our help comes from God. Ebenezer, near Mishpah, set up that Ebenezer, that stone, which means, you know, God who helps us. And God is a great helper in our life. Israel now, they repented you know, in their restoration. They came back to God. They made things right to God. God allowed them to go into Philistine territory, territory that belonged to them. And Israelites, this restoration of their land even, they went into what land that was theirs, that the Philistines over the last 20 years had taken. They went in and, and got that land back. Led to this of the great... Uh, restoration. When we talk about legacy, the church needs people like Samuel, don't they? You know, I don't know about you, but I'm concerned for the church of our Lord. I see churches, you know, maybe more interested in fun and games than they are to build upon the foundation of the Word of God, and fun and games will not grow the church. There's a church here in Huntsville. They have baby dedication. And I think about Hannah. Maybe they get it from Hannah and the idea of baby dedication. What mother in here had a baby with, with the idea that, that uh, I'm going to let my child be raised as a heathen? No, all of you had children with the idea that I'm going to raise my child to, to dedicate so they'll serve the Lord. And you don't need to have some... An event that's not authorized in the scripture. And I'm sorry, but to do things as the church that are not authorized in the word of God, isn't that how we got in the mess we got into in denominationalism and the great restoration movement? And now we have many of them are millennials and they're going back and they want to do these fancy fun things. I mean, isn't it sweet? Take your little baby there and take it up front. Oh, that is so precious, isn't it? But there's no authority for it, folks. And so the church needs men like Samuel. Four points we make. We need mothers that are praying for their sons. And Hannah prayed for Samuel. We also need people who can rise above their environment. Well, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Well, look at Samuel. He was raised in this environment with Hophni and Phinehas, and they turned out bad, but look, he became a great prophet of God and a great judge of Israel. We can overcome our upbringing, can't we? And then also the idea that we need to speak the whole counsel of God. When God gave him a revelation, Samuel, very boldly, he told Eli every word of it. He didn't make it sound a little sweeter. He just told him what God told him. We don't have prophets today. Preachers are probably as close as anything to a prophet. But we speak the word of God. And we need men like that. And we need men who will lead the church toward repentance and restoration, don't we? Who will lead the church back to the way that Jesus established it. Okay, I'm done. Uh, the, the young people are coming back. As they're coming back, do they come back or are they all back? Okay, well, well let's finish here a little bit of this. Uh, in Faith's Hall of Fame, Hebrews chapter 11, we read about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Rahab. In verse 32, we read about Gideon and also Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel. Boy, there's a legacy, isn't it? To be written in faith's hall of fame. What will you leave behind? Here are the hall of fame. Hopefully our name will be, could be added to that list. 
of individuals who are faithful in the Lord. He lived in an environment when Israel had departed from God, but yet he remained faithful to the God of heaven. We'll give them just a total two minutes, right? Or so we'll offer the invitation. Hey, great to be with you. I've heard so much about Farley and mainly through Wesley. I uh, thank the world of Wesley and uh, his two boys. I know mom's very proud and uh, I understand he's back at camp this week. So he stays busy. So, uh, but appreciate the Farley Church. I just meeting you and getting to know you uh, seem like a great group of people. And I hope the very best for you. Here they come. <laughs>